Anne-Marie Adèle Cossin was born in Commercy, in Meuse, Eastern France, on January 1831. Um, Her father, Nicolas Dieudonné Cossin, was a dyer. Little is known about the first years of her life in Commercy, but on December 1850, when she was 19 years old, she gave birth to a little girl named Gabrielle Emma Augustine. The first birth certificate gave us the name of the father who recognized her, Prosper Albuquerque. He was 23 years old and was a contractor. Um, they were not married, and she was at this time a milliner seller. Prosper Albuquerque didn't share uh, Adele's life any longer. Gabrielle's actual father will, in fact, be one of the sons of the house of Montfort, Philippe of Montfort. We did not recognize this, the child. Adèle Costin's personal situation in 1850 is therefore complicated. She was a single mother from a modest background. Um, in 1912, now Marquise of Landolfo Carcano, Adèle Cossin sells uh, her art collection for a total of nearly 4 million francs. This auction uh, was a big event for the great collector and art dealers of her time. So we will try to understand how a former milliner, daughter of a modest dyer from Commercy and single mother, gather uh, one of the most important collections of her time. With this woman, who I quote, uh, is born with a vocation for the arts as others have a religious vocation. In an approach that considers the collecting as a distinctive and emancipating social practice, we will try to shed light on the making of a collection gathered by a woman who escapes uh, by her marginal status, the social codes of the bourgeois marriage. So we will try to understand the way in which she invests the collection to assert herself and to emancipate uh, herself from her social status. So little is known about when Adèle Cossin arrived in Paris. Did she follow Prosper Albuquerque, uh, who left Meuse to reside uh, in saint mandé around uh, 1860? It's difficult to know. She expanded her, her financial assets in a very short time between her arrival in Paris around 1855 and the purchase of her private mansion uh, in 1867. We can uh, assume that she was quickly cared for by one or more rich men. Um, one of her first lovers seems to have been Edouard de Lesser, with whom she stayed friend uh, for 20 years. An archive specifies that he managed her assets before 1864. And at that date, he owed her uh, about 500,000 francs. Um, it's probably at this time that she abandons her name of Cossin for Cassin. And she sometimes found uh, under the name of Adèle or Blanche uh, of Cassin. In a letter to Alexandre Dumasson, on April 1881, she evokes this appropriation of a particle. Uh, it's a very common practice in the demi monde and uh, attributes to Edouard de Lesser this little vein side. Um, she was very little present in the press before 1880, which is quite surprising since the Mimondaine are generally omnipresent to promote themselves. Um, this, is, this is not the case of Adèle Cossin, who is very discreet. She was probably a kept woman rather than a courtesan. Her status, um, her social st status can be compared to someone like Alice of Lancet, who was uh, maintained by Nissim of Camondo rather than a great courtesan like Cora Pearl. Um, she appears in the press at the same time as she was asserting herself as a collector. The press, like Giblas or the Figaro, are then interested in her personal history. So I quote, 
um, this woman can be considered one of the most curious products of our contemporary society. So no, no, the nobility of Madame de Cassin is quite recent. Before playing the aspasie, she was a laundress. It is only on the age of 30 that fortune offered itself to her. So it's difficult to know to whom exactly she owes her fortune. It is certain that she is outside of the mainstream of the society. It deeply defined her identity in the 19th century society. She confesses to Alexandre Dumasson this delicate social situation, and she evokes in her letters the iron gates of the high society that are closed before her. Um, like many demi-mondaines, Adèle Cossin lived in the new fashionable district of Western Paris. She had a private mansion built for her at 1 Tilsit Street. It was built by the architect Ro de Fleury uh, on the model of Jack Ignace Itoff. The painting decor was entrusted to Alexis Mazeroy, Charles Chaplin, Alexandre Denuel, and Pierre Victor Galland. A set of photographs allows us to discover the interior of the, of the hotel. They were probably taken shortly before the auction of our collection. Um, for example, we can see there uh, the Salome by uh, Renio. So this luxurious uh, mansion, which she called a uh, golden cage, is the setting for a collection of paintings. The, 19, uh, the 1912 auction catalogs reveal, uh, reveals Adèle Cossin's interest uh, in the painting of her contemporaries. She owned at least uh, 89 uh, modern paintings, including a large number of Léon Bonnard, William Bougreau, Paul Baudry, Charles Daubigny, Alexandre Descamps, Narcisse Diaz de la Pena, Eugène Fomentin, Ernest Hébert, Ernest Messionnier, and Camille Corot. For example, she has uh, the Chestnut Alley by Rousseau, a dozen works by Antoine Volon, uh, many Gustave Goré, five Fortuny, including the Vicaria, four de la Croix, including the murder of the Bishop of Leach, etc. In addition, she has about 50 modern drawings and some sculpture by Rodin and, Fre and Fremier. Her collection also includes a coherent set of 39 old paintings, including Jean-Baptiste Gros, Rubens, and Veronese. Nevertheless, um, it is obvious that her taste is rather turned towards the art of her time. What is interesting in this collection is the high quality of the whole and the high, the high value on the market and also that she seems to collect, in particular, uh, some artists like Antoine Volon, Léon Bonnard, or Gustave Doré. Um, for me, there are two reasons for this. Uh, first, even if, uh, even if female bidders are very rare uh, in hotel room, in, uh, at the Hotel Rouault in the 19th century, Adèle Cossin could be found at the major auction in the second half of the, of the century. Um, the Figaro of April 1883 cites uh, the Marquis of Landolfo Carcano at the auction of Prince Naruskin. She was also uh, among the dealers and the collectors who bid at the Fortunis auction in 1875, uh, like uh, uh, among Dumas, Kainer, Fruzzi, etc. Uh, she was uh, indeed a client of Goupil. She bought painting by Ernest Hébert or Jean-Léon Jérôme between um, 60, uh, 1867 and 1872. Uh, she also regularly bought from Durand Ruel, notably the Chestnut Alley, and the view of the Alpes taken from the Fossil by Théodore Rousseau. She bought Henri Regnault Salomé for. 40,000 francs, which she sold in 1912 for uh, nearly 5 million francs. 
and in addition, Durand Ruel visit her until 96. Thus, she, etab she established herself in the very masculine world uh, of the Hotel de Rouault. And thanks to her acquisitions of very fashionable and expensive painters, she also established herself among the great collectors of her time. Secondly, she built up a very strong artistic soci sociability in the official academic circle on the Dirt's Republic which allowed her to buy important works from the, her numerous artist friends. Um, Adèle Cossin certainly held a salon and thus imposing her private mansion as a high place of artistic sociability. It is certain that she received at her home leading personalities. Uh, for example, Leon Gambetta, who came to her home uh, in the presence of Dumas in 1881. Maria Fortuny also visited her and said at the first time, this is how artists should be housed. Probably thanks to Edouard de Lesser and George Petit, with whom she was close, she frequented Léon Bonnard who painting a portrait of her daughter in 1866. Um, she had already bought his Pasca Maria in the Salon of 1860, uh, in 1863, yes. They meet in Paris, but also in Ustaritz. And there he painting for her the portrait of her servant, the old woman from Ustaritz. She was very faithful to him. Uh, the 1912 auction includes uh, included uh, less, uh, at least 10 works by the artist. We can also note that Juliette Adam, close to Léon Bonnat, was among uh, the, buyer, the buyer at the 1912 auction. She was also friends with Gustave Ricard, who painted a large portrait of her and two portraits of her daughter. And she gave this portrait to the Petit Palais Museum in 1906. She is very close to Alexandre Dumasson. Their correspondence was very regular between uh, 1881 and 1887. Adele expresses her, admira uh, her admiration and her attachment to, to the writer. And Alexandre Dumas seems to be under the spell for a while. In 1881, um, in one of her first letters to him, she expressed the wish to send him a painting by Octave Tassert, of whom Dumas was an important collector. She was therefore already very familiar with Dumas' collection and tastes. He certainly played a significant role in the, uh, in the making of the collection and was useful in the creation of her artistic network. For example, it's Alexandre Dumasson, who is an intermediary with Madeleine Le Maire, whose work she loves and to whom she entrusts the decor of, the, of her cabinet. The same year, in 1881, uh, Dumas introduced her to Antoine Volon, from whom she immediately brings uh, first work. She will be very faithful to him. Uh, the auction, the auction uh, catalogs includes night painting and many drawings by Volon and her son. The writer is also her intermediary with Giuseppe Denitis in 1882. And it's certainly Dumas who presents her Gustave Doré, of whom she collects many works. Dumas introduced her to Messonnier and most probably to Ernest Hébert. We know that she also frequents the studio of Benjamin Constant. She writes to Auguste Quint in 1883, mm -hmm. and she's friends with Frédéric Auguste Aguillami. She was also friends with Jean Gigou, who is a witness to her marriage on November 1889 with the Count of Landolfo Carcano. So the analysis of the similarity between the auction catalogs of Alexandre Dumas and Adèle's collection confirmed that he was probably a great 
influence on her collection choices. Nevertheless, she affirms her dates in her last letters. So I quote her, we will do as you said, I warn you that I believe in the bona and the landscape of Gustave Doré. Are you shutting? I don't care. I will de deliver others. And later, um, and later, I would not sell Doré's great landscape because I love it and the day will come when he is respected as a landscape artist. Therefore, uh, it appears that the collection practice supports Adèle Cossin's social assumptions. If it is uh, undoubtedly difficult for her to integrate amateurs' circles because of her social situation, her financial possibilities allow her to impose herself in the world of art and to affirm uh, herself as an important collector. She overcomes the gender gap that usually associates women with decoration and men with collecting. Um, suffering from a double marginality, the historical one of being a woman and the social one of life out of marriage in the 19th century, Adèle Cossin emancipated herself by building up an important collection of, art, of artworks. Free from male guardianship, her financial independence uh, allowed her to collect as she wished, and she still had to be recognized. To this end, she lent paintings for many exhibitions. Um, in 1883, she was one of the first private exhibition organized by the George Petit Gallery. The elite, the elite of collectors and critics went there. Octave Mirbeau uh, devote an article to his visit in the newspaper La France on October 1884. And Mirbeau is surprised and condescending to, the, to a collection from a woman whose job is not to love the arts. The, um, recognition, the recognition of women's collection in a patriarchal society goes through a final stage, a gift to a major museum. As uh, early as 1881, Adèle Cossin has a project to donate to the Louvre Museum. This donation was the subject of many discussions with Alexandre Dumasson concerning the selection of the work she needed to do. This desire to donate to the Louvre was very interesting at a time when only 10% of this museum's donors were women. The fact that her donation is accepted by the most important French museum will affirm Adèle's new social status and the high quality of our collection. This donation project was stopped. I still don't know why. And Adele chose uh, to sell our collection uh, in 1912. Adèle Cossin, now Marquise of Landofo Carcano, for whom art is, this, uh, art is the only place where one can take refuge in sadness as in joy, disappeared in 1921. Thank you very much for your attention. The title of this paper refers to an important uh, piece by Jacek Malczewski from his major period. Um, the title, the ended song, the Finnish song, um, this painting belongs to National Museum in, in Krakow. Um, uh, and in this collection is since 1915 and previously was a property of a person uh, which it depicts. So Ruzha Aleksandrovich. Um, um, my aim now is to, to discuss her person and character of her art collection of which most uh, is now in National uh, Museum in Krakow. Uh, this collection will be presented uh, here against a background um, of Krakow artistic milieu um, uh, since beginning of 20th century and some, let's say, social factors which shaped uh, it, um, I mean, this collection. 
uh, her person um, mostly known by, uh, by um, Malczewski painting is still not present in art historical research, Polish art historical research. Uh, what was changed uh, in previous years by exhibition on Hall Aleksandrowicz family in 2013, uh, and recently by a popular book by Professor Aleksander Skotnicki, and preparing now exhibition uh, in Historical Museum in Krakow, which will be open this fall, uh, October 2021. Uh, the based um, the based in Krakow. Uh, yeah, that was that was discussing um, uh, below um, a painting by Malczewski. We will we'll be back to this painting uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so, um, the based in Krakow Aleksandrowicz family since 1877 run prosperous business, namely they owned paper and art materials store which stocked many Krakowian modernist artists. Uh, the sign its popularity is still is still to discover um, on the backsides of museums and private collections artworks as the stamps and label of Aleksandrowicz manufacturing. Starting 1910, uh, its seat was located in lower story of so-called house under the globe, so don't put globus in Polish, prestigious Art Nouveau house near to Old City and very close to Academy of Fine Arts. Offering paper and art materials uh, in fashionable way, the company gained importance at the market, building a net of representative stores. Uh, its prosperity is related um, uh, to the years before, a little bit before um, World War um, the First, and especially interwar period, and leadership of Regina Aleksandrowicz, so Ruzha, uh, Ruzha's mother. Uh, the company is still remembered as the biggest, um, as the biggest then uh, at the beginning of 20th century paper warehouse uh, in Poland. Uh, Ruzha Aleksandrowicz, uh, born 1986, died 1973, uh, entrenched to the mother's storehouse in years preceding outbreak of World War I. She didn't start her own family, stayed with mother and devoted to paper storehouse. She was perceived as a daughter of company. I'm basing here on mostly on retrospective paper on Ruzha Aleksandrowicz by Kordian Zamorski from 1972. Uh, so daughter of company who knew all artists in Krakow, a woman of great charm, intelligence and heart. Uh, Ruzha was known as an aficionado of drawing and painting. Her benevolent character was mentioned by many as well as her economical support to the artists. She standed for the artists offering them little money, food, and of course, art materials uh, from the um, family, Aleksandrowicz family storehouse. In this way, she gathered a whole gallery of her own portrait, portraits. Uh, Ruzha's collection uh, consisted of more than 50 pieces of oil paintings, drawings, and etchings. Uh, 39 pieces she gave to National Museum in Krakow um, in 1950, and more than 10 she kept as a private property. In this body of artwork, artworks, one may distinguish some characters. The first one would be because of the name of the artist. We see the names uh, of the most renowned Krakowian artists and chancellors of Academy of Fine Arts in Krakow in interwar period. So, for example, Todor Aksentowicz, Jacek Majewski, or Wojciech Weiss, here presented the painting by Weiss from her collection. Uh, those artists were significantly older than Ruzha. However, most of Ruzha's artworks were created by younger modernist artists, her, let's say, age mates. Edward Baranowski and Tytusz Czyżewski um, were artists with the highest number of works, um, both of them represented with, uh, with four. The Aleksandrowicz store, um, the Aleksandrowicz store may be seen uh, as a salon of Krakowian modern art. Due to academy uh, building spatial closeness, that place must attract attracted all art adepts who are present at the university. Ruzha had in her 
uh, own collection, artists who made a careers, in, a careers in Polish art, but also lesser artists, which names are nowadays hard to find in art historical resources. Um, like presented here, a uh, portrait of uh, painter Czciński by female uh, painters, Kruvna, we don't know of her uh, biography. The only foreign artist was Marcel Gromer, represented by etching, probably a gift to Ruzha by Parisian friend Orz Gromer, so Tadeusz Makowski. At the end of 20s and in 30s, Ruzha visited France regularly, but had no interest uh, in French art, which is, uh, which is no, uh, not present in, uh, in her collection. The second distinction may be uh, made between more tradi traditional and progressive modernist movements. Here, the most radical propositions are to observe in Titus Czyżewski works, leader of first avant-garde group called um, the Polish Expressionist and later Fordist. The birth of new classicism in 1910s is clearly visible in Jacek Mierzejewski ever. Uh, here are examples of Tytus Czyżewski and uh, Jacek Mierzejewski works. Uh, for the other hand, there is art of colorists, so-called colorists, which broke into bloom in mid-20s and later was the most popular idiom of Polish modern art in general. Uh, here, here, Czesław Rzepiński, uh, portrait of Ruzha. Uh, Ruzha probably, as a connoisseur, judged art more intuitively, making references more to her own friendships with artists than to their artistic affiliations. Um, though uh, willy-nilly, her art collection may be perceived as a panorama of Krakow art milieu uh, between 1910s and 1930s, excluding the most conservative products of the local art world, for example, as, uh, let's say, horse painting by Cossack family, uh, but also um, socially engaged uh, avant-garde of 30s, for example, Grupa Krakowska, present at the, um, at the uh, Art Academy uh, of Krakow then. Um, so character of Ruzha's collections was definitely dependent on uh, art uh, of Academy of Fine Arts, its circle, let's say. Another parameter to analyze Alexandrovich idea of collecting is a subject. Running the list of paintings down, we find the common themes like landscape uh, and still lifes, some pieces depicting Polish Highlanders, Gurale by Jan Rembowski and Wilhelm Verwinski. Those work was not commissioned, uh, were not commissioned, uh, commissioned uh, by Ruzha, but given by artists exemplify a standard art production. However, some of them are quite unique, like Matka Boska Częstochowska, who presented uh, on the slide. Uh, so, Black Madonna of Częstochowa by Zygmunt Waliszewski. These artists made in exactly the same period uh, pastiches of Polish national imagery. Here, he refers in uh, this famous miraculous image and shapes the depiction in primitive, naive way in accordance to develop the poetics of, uh, of his art. This painting would be, as a gift of the artist, a protective image of Ruzha and only one painting on Christian theme in the collection. For Ruzha, as fully assimilated woman on Jewish origin, also a sign of her affiliation to Polish culture. Uh, a trace of such thinking is contained is contained in photographic portrait of Ruzha posing with a reproduction of Maurits Gottlieb painting Shylock um, and Jessica, probably lost now. Gottlieb, already then seen as the most talented 19th century Jewish painter, died in Krakow almost 30 years earlier. In this particular painting, he depicted Shakespeare's play characters, which may be interpreted symbolically as two approaches to Jewish tradition. Once equating with it, so Shylock, and on the other hand, uh, assimilation to Christian culture, so Jessica. In presented photography, Ruzha, of course, plays a role of Jessica. She and her family were involved in Zionist movement, donating some Jewish organizations like Beit Lehem, but also made an effort to assimilate to Polish culture through business and resulting from it an involvement in art and contact with uh, the art world. The portrait painting dominates in Ruzha art collection. 
There are some self-portrait of painters donated as a sort of, let's say, a business card. Here are example of a well-known modernist painter and professor of Krakow Academy, Kazimierz Szychulski. But most interesting uh, are portraits of Ruzha Aleksandrowicz by befriended artists. In all of them, we see no extravagance, no fashionable dresses or haircuts of 1920s, rather stable and wealthy lady who belongs more to uh, the fantasical culture than to Les Anefol. Her delicate nurture and pensive temper is visible almost uh, in every piece, especially in her portrait by a uh, little known uh, Krakowian painter uh, based in Paris, Edward Baranowski in Modigliani Manor. As we may guess, uh, those were not commissions, but gifts of the artist to Ruzha, executed in Aleksandrovich store or at the academy. Collecting them, uh, she built a set of at least 16 portraits of her, what maintained her important role in Krakow modernist net. She was a friend of the artist, but also a face of her family company. Alexandrovich store provided basic artists, uh, art materials, paper sheets uh, and uh, painting supports uh, without which they cannot create. Uh, Malczewski, the ended song, belongs to artist paintings which refer to the theme of death. Purple dress of Ruzha, musical instruments, so Russian balalaika, uh, and group of harvesters in the background are clearly vanitas symbols. Musical instrument plays here a passive role, and through it and poetic title, the artist creates here an imagined situation of a moment really after a musical performance. The old master of Krakowian artwork, then 60, five years old Malczewski, raises in a portrait of 34 years old Ruzha a problem of, um, a problem of elusiveness of beauty and art creation. Uh, pointed here painting continues artist 1910s, series of female portrait and allegory compositions in one. The ended song composition in, is close to Nikola Legionov of 1916 in, from the collection of National Museum in Krakow. Uh, this last painting concerns a dedication of the Piłsudski Polish Legion soldiers at the front of uh, World War I and struggle for independent Poland uh, in this war. If we consider the ended song as a compositional mirror uh, image to Nikola Legionov, the Ruzha, uh, Ruzha would be an allegory of dedication for art and symbol of a new Polonia. Ruzha collection consists a specific case. One may claim her collecting was just by the way, as a result of uh, co-leading a, a family company, and then would be, a, let's say, um, example of institutional collection. Uh, analyzing uh, the photos from Regina and uh, Ruzha Aleksandrowicz apartment by, um, uh, in Krakow from the beginning of 20th century seem precisely decorated with paintings interior. Here Ruzha ignores a photographer uh, at the presented photography, uh, um, ignores a creator of, uh, of that photo and turns to her artworks. Her uh, here collector is fully associated with her space of living and existing their um, prizes of their collecting. The idea of gathering particular artworks would be here a personal encounter and involvement uh, and involved in it, uh, in this encounter, individual uh, feelings of her. Uh, the house of Aleksandrovich was perceived in Krakow as a wealthy but also socialist oriented family, even when actually they weren't involved uh, in ideological disputes. However, among them, Aleksandrovich family, I mean, only uh, Ruzha's brother, Zygmunt, was politically active. Zygmunt holded a position in city council of Krakow. He founded also an organization for Jewish orphans as being um, uh, its president. He supported a soci uh, society, uh, society for health protection of Jewish population. Ruzha and her siblings were members of uh, Polish Socialist Party, PPS. Even we don't know any written statements on collecting uh, by Ruzha, and none of her artworks had symbolically a political dimensions, it's encouraging to see uh, the act of collecting as a socialist activity. 
especially her relation with Tadeusz Makowski and preserved letters from 1930-1932 uh, show Róża's engagement in artists' everyday life. She sent it to Paris, art materials, vinyls, or even food, what consistent and important help for artists who lived in a modest way. Uh, in its time, Róża Aleksandrowicz collection was unique to, uh, due to two factors. One is she owned uh, contemporary art of her time when most of Polish collectors of interwar period were focused, of, uh, were focused on 19th century um, masters and the renowned artists of uh, modernist movement, Young Poland uh, movement purchased from secondary market. The second one is that among them were no female collectors. Of course, women were present in, uh, in a collector's world, in collecting milieu, but more as wives of husbands uh, or, or, let's say, daughters of, uh, of good houses. Ruzha activity would be here uh, an in apparent phenomena on local scene. Collector's landscape of Krakow was dominated in 1920s by two events, uh, mostly by Felix Manga uh, 1920 and Eras Boromsz 1923, donation of their collections to National Museum in Krakow. Ruzsa did the same in 1950, but in a totally different political situation. Aleksandrowicz family got off the Krakow early before outbreak of World, World, World War the Second. When Nazis were near to Lvov, Lviv, Ruzsa got through to Kazakhstan. As an only member of the family, returned after work to Krakow and regained their estate. The company again ran between 1937, 1947 and 1949. And in 1950, in political reality of communism, was nationalized and sequestrated by the, uh, by the state. Uh, trying to leave for Israel to join her brother Zygmunt, then Zinai, it's almost certain that Ruzsa was forced to leave in Poland part of the collection, especially when since 1946, the artworks in private hands must be officially registered. Preserved in National Museum in Krakow list of 39 pieces is very schematic. Document with given name of authors, titles and dimensions. Short words of thanks of, uh, of thanks of National uh, Museum's director, uh, Professor Dobrowolski, then uh, some mistakes and abbreviations maintain its impersonal character. There is no legible hierarchy among the artworks uh, in the document, but at the top of the list was placed the ended song by Malczewski, the biggest and even today the most precious painting of this collection, which title in a sinister way relates to the fate of the uh, Ruzsa's artworks. My purpose is just an attempt in evaluation um, of Ruzsa's activity as a collector. Still, artworks and documents preserved by family and friends of her in the private archives in Israel must be subjects uh, must be must be subject of uh, art historical research uh, and may enrich the image of her aspirations. Her running family business, she became an art aficionado and collector. A closeness of Aleksandrovich store to Academy of Fine Arts was a key to its success and factor shaping Ruzsa's collection. Due to personal relations, she owned the works by renowned Krakowian artists, but also by minor adepts of art. I pointed, I pointed out that uh, her strikes were an important part of assimilation process to Polish intelligentsia culture. Pronounced and personal character of this collection is clearly visible and make her choices unique in comparison to almost unpresent in first decades of 20th century Polish women collectors. Uh, thank you for your attention, thank you. Hoda was never a king nor a noble man nor even a bourgeois. He was the son of an employee of the Paris prefecture with no personal fortune and no inheritance from a collector. From the age of 14, he was taught at the Petite Ecole, which was based on the observation and copying of Greco-Roman art. But Rodin failed three times to enter the Ecole des Beaux-Arts and didn't win the Prix de Rome, which at that time guaranteed an artist's career. His career then took over longer and more uncertain paths. He invented an imaginary museum enriched by engravings, photographs, and casts 
but also by travel and works in museums. This is not surprising for an artist of his time. But around 1890, an earthquake swept away the tranquil image of the sculpture, posing in the midst of some antiquities. A male collector, Rodin amassed better yet devoured over 6,500 objects between 1890 and 1917, between 50 and 77 years old in the days of rising fame and financial wealth. He naturally collected antiques as a return to his youth, also following a line of collectors, kings and princes from antiquity. Rodin's genius between quotation marks, if not its singularity, should not prevent him from being placed in his historical context a time of both archaeological discoveries and the history of the circulation of artifacts. Let us look at let us look at the the collection from different angles and not reduce it to a single interpretation, whether psychoanalytical, historical, archaeological, or comparative. The study of the collector also allows us to draw a portrait of the man in society, in his art, and in his in intimacy. Rodin also belongs to the category of artist collector, a genre in itself that transcends societal upheavals and the emergence of the bourgeoisie. And what did Rodin do with this object of reality in the construction of his own fiction? The collection appears, first of all, as a primitive mental structure whose imprint can be found in all of Rodin's places starting with the studio of the Folie Payen that Rodin rented in 1888 in order to work there with Camille Claudel when their relationship was at its most intense. This was also where later he began accumulating artifacts that seemed to replace their shared creativity and love, a practice in continue in Meudon after their separation in 1892. Rodin imposed the same occasionally contradictory obsession upon visitors, observing, showing, and concealing, amassing to excess, combining fragments of diverse origins, quest questioning life and artifacts, and moving from the collection regarded as an antechamber to the creative spaces with an early blueprint for his future museums already in mind. In Rodin's official studio at the Depot des Marbres, des Marbres, he exhibited masterpieces that were carefully se selected and turned into fetishes in the creative melting pot. Other accounts illustrate the artist's solitude in his mystical dimension and gave the image of a tumultuous dwelling where the work and the collection mingle in accordance with the iconography of the 19th century from the Balsacian dwelling to the artist studio, and which will endure in the 20th century with Picasso, for example. By mimicry, Rodin reproduced at the Villa de Briand at Meudon, sorry, a place similar in spirit to those of his friends Claude Monet or Edmond Goncourt, adapted to the personality of the sculptor. Between 80, 1890, and 1917, pilgrimage to the Grand Man fed the fiction of the collection. From the beginning of the 1910s, the first collection that of the house and studio assembled between 1819 and 1910 overflowed and was enriched in the future museum planned for the Hotel Biron. The idea of a great hall guided the joint presentation, illustrating the spirit of the nation to the French state in 1916. The collection became inseparable from the work and was to outlast the man for posterity. Can Rodin's role as a collector be solely put down to his passion for objects when the notion of profusion seems so central to his life? The fondness for quantity combined with comparison was evident in other sorts of collection. His drawings and photographs of artworks and architecture gathered together in albums, 
the books of, in his library of his collection of drawings, prints, and paintings by other artists, added to which were the sketches, words, and phrases that he jotted down in notebooks as reminders and a means of comprehending art and the world. Then there was a, the mass of plaster figures and molds, the tools used to make copies, abundance, order and disorder surrounded him everywhere, not to mention recomposition in his works of assemblage between 1890 and 1914, the period in which the collection took shape. The latter mirrored this process of recuperating the plaster figures modeled in the main for the gate of hell in the 1880s. Figurines and Bozzetti now compose an archaeological collection for the colossal work, assembled in series and reassembled using the technique of marcotage. Collection that is reinforced and legitimized often a posteriori by the fragments of the collection. Rodin took approach to the extreme by removing several beloved treasures and combining his disparate collections. Some of his plaster figures were thus seen emerging from antique vases, transforming the past into the present and turning an object from his collection into a material for the, a work in progress. This dynamic ongoing process that led him from idea to object and object to idea questioned the whole concept of a fixed, static, or even complete collection. Rodin's collection questions the relationship with time, not only in the artist's chronology, but also in, the, in that of the artifacts from antiquity and their creation to the early 20th century, the time of their rediscovery. Whatever the means at his disposal, he adopted the same approach in the early phases of his collection assembled in his house and studio, his choices were eclectic. Works from Greece and Rome stood alongside those from Egypt, Asia, and European Middle Age and Renaissance. But archives showed the acquisition that acquisition of medieval Asian and Egyptian works sped up around 1910 when the idea of an encyclopedic museum was germinating in his mind. Rodin used mixed original works of art with a series of casts to which he had fossils of sea urchins, shells, and other natural forms, and it remembers Henry Moore's collections. He mounted them like small, his small antiquities and bestowed the statue of artwork upon them. Rodin never parted with the works he purchased. He has no desire to give them away or exchange them in order to buy others, although he received few presents. A large number of people ensured a lively circulation of artworks at this time, archaeologists and scholars, antique dealers, brokers, and other go-betweens played a leading role in the assembling of collection, choosing what was best for each one according to the state of the market, the preference and finances of the buyer. There were career, careers transporting artifacts who created invisible links between collectors across the whole of Europe. Yet, while it is while he surrounded himself with a network of art dealers, Rodin refused the help of scholars. He preferred his own vision as an artist, able to distinguish beauty and truth, and keen on the sensory experience dear to the, to the 18th century philosophers. In that, he is different from the duet collector, scholar, and broker's partnership, followed by Edward Perry Warren and John Marshall, Carl Jacobsen, and Wolven Elbig, or Waldemar Schmidt, or even Ra Raoul Varroquet and Franz Cumont. Out of the sculptor network of around 100 antique dealers, a few key figures emerge in specialist fields, 
Eligeladaki s'inspire donc à Stellanos in Greco-Roman art, Marius Tano and Joseph Altunio in Egyptian art. Until the outbreak of war in 1914, which put an end to the circulation of artworks. Acting as veritable catalyst, antique dealers share lots composed of finds from excavation or items from former collections between their different clients. There's thus were visible or invisible links between these personalities through objects. Thus, similarities and antinomies arose between Rodin's collection and those uh, of his contemporaries. Rodin built up his collection among antiquarians during the heyday of archaeological discoveries and sales of 18th and 19th century collection, following in the footsteps of aristocratic collectors and archaeologists and being part of a long lineage. The sculptor bought mainly in Paris from antique dealers traveling around the Mediterranean. He didn't leave Europe and did not visit Greece. Even in Italy, it seemed more absorbed by visiting museums and enriching his imaginary museum than in acquiring antiques. Traveling Two centuries, this collection borrowed their codes, changing tests, testers, and discoveries to a certain extent. In the late 19th century, Rodin took an interest in archaic art, began collecting Cypriot and Iberian sculptures like Picasso, and invested a large part of his fortune in an extraordinary Egyptian collection, reflecting the, change, the changes in his way of thinking and his commitment commitment to modernity. Also, a contemporary of young artists such as Pablo Picasso or Henry Matisse, he di didn't go so far as they did along his, this path, including so-called primitive art in his collection parsimoniously. Yet, he never refused gifts that were made to him as this funerary uh, fine post. When building his collection, Rodin seems to abolish space and time. In one portion of his life, a little more than two decades, he assembled artifacts from different horizons and eras and placed them alongside his own works. At the Villa de Brillant, the oldest prehistoric or ancient pieces stood amongst extra European, Chinese, Japanese, or Indian objects. All were regarded as antiquities in the broader sense of the term and were often replaced by the word treasures or gods when Rodin spoke of them. These all embracing names enable Rodin to establish a comparative and egalitarian system of thought between geographical origins and eras. Like Picasso, he used his antiquity as traditional objects between the other and his work, an unavoidable pathway to seeing and understanding what his culture brought to modernity. The antique combined with the present and heralded the future, not as an inspiration, but as a mirror and a gauge. Rodin reveals, it, reveals himself even more in the mirror of his fellow collections artists, writers, or industrial, industrialists in the, this place as in his practice or other rituals. The objective of this collection were multiple. Rodin was also an artist and built his collection as a mirror of his work. He developed it at the Villa des Brillants in Meudon, a place open to illustrious visitors, a workshop, a place of meditation, a place that nourished the mythology and discourse of the artist. He was inspired by the story of Goethe and Diderot to stage the theater of the collection. The collection linked and measured him to the collectors of the past, combining change and constancy. Written accounts and photographs of Roda and his contemporaries seem to draw on arch archetypal images from the 18th and 19th century, 
when collections began being assembled by the middle classes, replacing the former royal collections, henceforth houses in museum. They were full of the same rituals described in 1798 by Goethe in, his, in the essay, The Collector and His Circle, Creation of Order and Identity, Formation of Taste and Feeling, Curative and Educational Virtues, Element of Mediation. Collecting was not merely an accumulation of static objects, but gave rise to numerous practice, as Walter Benjamin pointed out. The collector makes the transfiguration of things his concern. To him falls the season task of disvasting things of their commodity character by taking possession of them. But the sculptor does not content himself with seeing the beauty of an object. Whether consciously or unconsciously, he repeated cliché, gesture, and words invented by others. Like Denis Diderot, writing about Pygmalion and Galate by Falconet, exhibited at the Paris Salon in 1763, Rodin remodeled his antique in his mind, retaining details and concealing the weakest parts with clothes, as you can see on this picture. Artifacts aroused all his five senses, but touch remains his prefer preferred senses through which the sculptor and the collector at the peak of, a, of aesthetic emotion merged with the object into sensual living flesh. Rodin, as Rilke, subscribed to the idea of d'Alembert, stone must be sensitive. Or Denis Diderot, flesh can be made from marble and marble from flesh. Rodin sized the body of the statue which appeared to respond to the, his ardor, I quote him. It is truly flesh, he said. You would think it's molded by kisses and caresses. You almost expect when you touch this body to find it warm. There seemed to be an exchange of joy and pleasure between this object and Rodin, who was captivated by their therapeutic charm. As if hallucinating, the collector mixed together live models, collectors' items, and nature. From imaginary museum to actual museum, possession metamorphosed the artifact and incorporated it into the sculpture biography. The collection took its place in, in extimacy, an expression indicating an intimacy henceforth visible to everyone. Rodin used the money he earned as an artist to acquire artifacts and to thus transform in both a symbolic and real manner the void left by his cultures that had been sold through the acquisition of antiquity. Rodin did not inherit a collection as did Gustave Moreau, Carl Jacobsen or Goethe. The collection brings him into another tradition, that of the artist collector. Rejected by the Academy, Rodin nevertheless achieved social status and enjoyed the trappings of power. He also used his collection as propaganda tools to enhance the value of his own works. Christophe Pomian wrote, a collection is an universal reality coextensive in time with Homo sapiens and attested to be it in rudimentary form in all human society. For they all communicate with the invisible and it is within such an exchange that collections are formed. And it was within the realm of the invisible that Rodin's collection was born as, as is shown by his own works, World and Works. In 19, 17, he purchased a mourner from the tomb of Jean Berry in the Saint Chapelle in Bourges, intended to guide the deceased towards the year after, the ultimate relic that would accompany him in the final months of his life. Picasso made a distinction between the, his African statuette and his other artifacts by virtue of their magical power. Powers. But isn't it this magic at the heart of the very process of building any collection? Thank you.
First uh, comment and question from Camila. My thoughts after the first two papers are that Professor Pomian, mentioned also by Benedict, uh, was right when he wrote that in Europe, there was no phenomenon of women's collecting in the second half of the 19th century and at the turn of the 20th century. Such a movement existed in the USA and in Europe there were single female collectors. Sometimes they were almost the only women collectors in their cities. Pauline Tomasz, this is a question for you. Do you share this view? And also uh, questions, two questions from Navojka. Tomasz, many thanks, very interesting, many questions. But the first one, did she have also paintings um, in, in the Polish Jewish uh, art, from the Polish Jewish uh, artist? By Polish, by Polish Jewish artist. By, ah, sorry, it was N. Okay, by the Polish Jewish artists in her collection, as for example, Leopold and Henrik Gottlieb. And another question, what happened with Ruja's collection during the German occupation? And also question from, uh, from, uh, from the audience from Facebook, if uh, the publishing house, uh, Ruja's publishing house uh, was also editing postcards, and a question from Tomasz to, um, to Benedict um, related to uh, uh, Rodin's collection. How did Rodin perceive aesthetically so-called primitive art? When did he purchase the first pieces of, of it? Thank you. I had also a question to Pauline. I don't know if I still have time to, to ask. Uh, I maybe maybe just briefly. My question is um, based on the book from Anne Higonet, one's own museum, where she's describing the collection of Wilhelmina von Halvard, a Swedish women collector. The topic of women collect women collectors is, mm -hmm. in my opinion, very very interesting. Um, and there, Anne Higonet is is mentioning two portraits of, of Wilhelmina, one uh, before she created a collection and one after creating a collection. And they are completely different and they are also arranged completely differently. So the first one is depicting her um, as a young woman lady and the other as a major, major uh, conscious woman. The second portrait is placed not in the gallery from, from the, the uh, family gallery. The second painting portrait is in the, in the living room, in the prominent place above the fireplace. So there's a slightly different um, depicting of, of women as a collector, and this is how she's depicting herself in, uh, within the gallery she's creating in the, in the house. So I'm just marking those questions, so please go ahead. Um, who would, ah, there's also a question from Agnieszka Kruczewska, sorry, she raised her hand. So um, we, we still collect this question and then I give, uh, give the voice to, to the panelists. Agnieszka? Oh no, so it, it was a mistake, sorry. It was a mistake. Oh, okay. So we can then we can start answering the questions. So perhaps Benedict, would you like to answer the question first? Uh, in, in fact, Hoda uh, didn't buy primitive art. He received gifts from friends. Uh, for example, the, the the sculpture I show you uh, uh, from Laos. Uh, has been given um, by um, by somebody in 906 uh, uh, after the, the the fair in Marseille. There was a very big uh, colonial fair in Marseille, and uh, he met somebody who who went uh, to Laos, and he decided to to give to Rodin this sculpture. And after uh, after 1910. Uh, Rodin received cards from from uh, students from the Ecole des Beaux Arts of Mexico, with cards of the the masterpieces of the of the Mexi Mexico Museum, archaeological museum. But we uh, he didn't talk about this. And uh, um, 
of course, uh, I, I can't develop in uh, so <laughs> in 20 minutes all what I, I invite you to the exhibition we do now uh, in the Picasso Museum and in the, in the uh, Musée Rodin to compare the two collections. And it shows that um, at this time, in about 1900 and 1910, uh, Rodin was a um, an old man and Picasso was a young man and they didn't receive primitive art in the same way and there's many uh, difference but what like Rodin in uh, what I, I I use more the, the term of archaism and I put also Egypt in this uh, in his uh, his um, his will to discover other art and other type of uh, of a type of sculpture and other rules of sculpture, uh, but he, maybe he was too. He was a nineteenth century man at the at the origin, so he didn't he didn't buy uh, African art, for example, and uh, but he was interested. Is interested by Iberian art, as Picasso, for example, he bought some Iberian bronzes. So he didn't go so far than young people at that young artists at that time, but he was interested by uh, new discoveries and new arts uh, from antiquity. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Mm, Pauline, are you there? Can yeah. you see you? Great. So the question from Camila, do you agree with 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 the um, opinion of Pomian that there were no women collecting in in, in Europe like it, uh, they did? In... The second question from Agnieszka? The second, well, the first was from Camila and the second, the question, let's say it was quite of my comment and a question the same. So uh, were there some visible, uh, was it visible in the arrangement of collection, for example, the women emancipation, was it only about collecting, but also about the the way how they were arranging their, uh, their collections, for example, Adele? So um, in my research, I tried to demonstrate the importance of gender and social position uh, in the analysis of the interiors and, collect, uh, and um, collection of the demi monde and material possession crystallized. Ah, sorry for oh my. <laughs> okay. Great. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. And um, material possession um, crystallized specific issues of uh, social assertion and emancipation of this woman. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a very important point because of their marginal situation and decorating a house and collecting is seen as a perfectly respectable uh, activity for a woman, uh, but also uh, like a chance to assert their individualities. So um, it's a good pretext for a category of women who seek to make themselves um, respectable. And they appropriate aristocratic and bourgeois uh, practice, practices. Um, Adèle Cousin is uh, singular because she does it with a great talent and a great intelligence, but um, uh, she is singular uh, by the uh, by the typology of her collection too. But I observe in my corpus that a majority of the Mimondaine collected in the second part of the century. Um, it is rather a practice of um, bourgeois collection, such as Manuel Sharpie mm -hmm. has studied, studied it. And women collectors are invisible uh, because they. Uh, they often collect um, decorative arts, tapestry, porcelain, and mm -hmm. um, which are which are not recognized as great collection of fine arts. So, I think this is the um, limit of Christophe Pomian's analysis. Um, the question of financial financial autonomy is an important key to understanding mm -hmm. this issue. Um, and it is a fact uh, 
um, this collection, uh, uh, um, I don't know how to say that, um, there is a, a dialogue uh, on, with the decoration and furnishing. So mm -hmm. it's a very important point uh, mm -hmm. to make visible the, this phenomenon of female collection. It, mm -hmm. is a, it is most a question of definition. Yes, and this is like there's a this borderline between decoration and collecting in case of women is blurred, let's say. Yeah. Yes, like you said, men are collecting and women are decorating, and this is somehow changing the whole whole thing. Great, thank you. Um, sorry, you wanted to add something, or um, can I? Great, thank you very much. This was really, really great answer. And uh, Tomasz, so now it's well, your maybe, turn, please. Yeah, yeah, maybe add water to, to Camilla's question. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah I, I definitely share this view. Uh, it's, it's, it's clearly visible uh, that, um, that woman collecting is... Um, I wouldn't say that it's hasn't existed, but still is, uh, it's not so common, it's not so present, especially in Polish culture. Uh, I don't know, maybe it would be my question to, to Pauline, uh, what about another female collectors in France then in the same, in the same period? Uh, but uh, in Poland, uh, I analyze mostly, mostly um, this grant, uh, there were no another um, uh, women collectors like Ruja. Maybe Ruja's collection wasn't a spectacular collection with trophy uh, paintings, trophy uh, trophy artworks, but still, uh, that her that was her own um, own collection um, collected with uh, with her taste, with uh, her uh, relations with artists, uh, and that's that's strange because uh, especially in, in Poland, uh, even during partitions, uh, women had quite early political rights. Um, uh, in comparison uh, to uh, to other territories in Europe, it, it wasn't common. Still, at the beginning of twentieth century, uh, but there were no Polish women art collectors. If we uh, if we talk about, uh, for example, um, uh, glass collection in Warsaw, then about. Jakub and Alina, not only Alina von de Glasnova, yes, yes. Uh, mostly perceived as a, as a painter. Um, yes, yeah, so that, that would be my answer. And question to Pauline, what about uh, women collecting uh, in, in, in the same period in France, a part of, um, of uh, Adèle Cousin? Um, um, gener generally, it's... Um, it's more about women who continue to collect after the death of, uh, of their husband. So it's the case of Nelly Jackma, for example. Um, it's, it's true that um, collector, women collectors completely independent of their husband uh, are rare. Um, but in, the, um, uh, in my corpus, I have Valtes de la Bigne and she have a, a, a big collection of the uh, Trédoire de Taille. So uh, it just, it, it's, it's difficult to, to, to answer. Um, je... There's, yeah. Um, one, one thing which came also to my mind was, was also the collection of Gabriela Zapolska. Yes. It's also, I think one of the important women collectors. Uh, there was also Julia Wertheim, who was like, like you said, like Alina and Jakub Glass. There was also uh, so this was a couple uh, collection. Uh, this was also a case of Wertheim's family, and there are uh, hands are yes. raising. So yes, Camilla. Milena, can I uh, can I say something because yes. <laughs> there was this was my questions. Yes, of course. Uh, and the question uh, was a bit tricky on my part uh, because I try to keep reading text about women collectors in Europe. Uh, they are always seen as individualists, single things. Figures. They, they're no, they're no such uh, thing a phenomenon of women collectors. So that uh, was the question. Maybe we should organi organize uh, a big European project uh, 
<laughs> and see if this was really the case. I think we have yet uh, to explore that. It looks a bit like this. Uh, we have a map uh, on which we can mark individual cases. We don't see uh, the whole yet. And that was the question, not the question or question of invisible. It is a fact, it's the fact. But uh, my question is not, not about the uh, the collection of women uh, and what uh, they uh, collected, uh, paintings, glass, furniture, whatever. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, in general speaking, is there a phenomenon of women collectors mm -hmm. uh, in Europe? Uh, and the tricky, tr tricky question is that because I'm uh, I'm still uh, I'm still thinking about this uh, this uh, this text of Pomian, mm -hmm. and I think we have to uh, we have to try to wonder uh, if uh, if we could see something else in this phenomenon in this uh, in this uh, in this subject. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I add something? Yes. I simply would like to, to say that, for example, there were the collections, I mean, or the portraits, the collections of women with, with, of very special uh, kind, namely young women who were, let's say, muse of artists. As, for example, in Poland, you have Pareńskie, the both Pareńskie, who are painted by Wojtkiewicz and let's say these artists, but afterwards they married and their, their portraits went to, let's say, the a common uh, ownership, I would say, of the married couple. But if you think, if you think, for example, about Blochbauer and this Klimt collection, this was the Golden Adela. This this was also very interesting because it was her. They were her portraits, but of course paid by her husband. So I suppose that that one has to think in the category. Uh, who is portrait, who's, for whom it was done, and by whom it was ordered. And of course, the very special kind of collection where women are present, they are widows. <laughs> Namely, when they, when they simply are the heirs of the collections of- And the money, common, and common, the common, money. Yes, okay. <laughs> common collections. They were uh, often common collections, but I see, I suppose there's very interesting very interesting case how for example few widows develop after after the death of their husbands uh, the collection so these are only let's say small remarks mm -hmm. yes but landscape is very complicated we have aristocrats women collectors artist women collectors etc and uh, uh, i think that we we have to try to see uh, the whole Mm -hmm. Maybe not this time, but but in the future, in, in our research. Um, so, thank you. Agnieszka Kluczewska was raising her hand. I'm giving you the yeah. voice in a second. I will just uh, read the great example of the couple's collection can be Maria Rhodes, uh, can be found in uh, the Russian collecting at St. Petersburg. There's a family collection of Elena Pavlovna and Mikhail Sergeyevich, uh, uh, they assembled a great collection of paintings by Boucher, Canaletto, Tiepolo, etc., as well as French household items of the 18th century. And there's an important message also from Thomas Stammers. Thanks for this very interesting exchange. I'm taking the liberty of sending you a link to a special issue I edited this year related to 19th century female collectors in Britain, France, and the US. It is it also has a methodological instru uh, introduction. So I think it's worth checking and seeing the link. Thank you very much, Thomas and Maria. And um, uh, yes, Agnieszka, please. Now. Uh, just uh, just a, a fact, uh, uh, Professor Tomian's book was pub published 20 years ago. 20 years is many, many times. The, the, we, Agnieszka, excuse me, are you having um, uh, headsets or no, something? No, no, no because no, we... Just, no, uh, it's uh, just a question of... Oh, uh, Professor Pomian uh, <laughs> book was pub published 20 years ago. It's just yes. to close the, our uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. We all work in, the, in this topic now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, it's open. It's, it's work yes. in progress. 
Yes, of course. This this is also changing the context of of Pomian's words. Yes, and uh, still one question to Benedict. Many thanks for your contribution. I think we can um, we agree all it was very interesting. Do you think that there is a link between Rodin's art collecting practices and his graphic language? In particular, what concerns his experiments with the technique of collage? Uh, yes, I think there's a, a link and uh, there's no difference between collage and uh, the assemblage I show you with the uh, vase and uh, the, his figure in plaster. You can find things very similar in the collage. And also um, there's a very important uh, subject topic about uh, the, the vase, the antique vase and uh, Rodin's drawings. And uh, I had a communication about this subject, if you are interested, uh, in Ianasha seminar about uh, Greek, vase, Greek vases uh, this year. So if you are interested by the subject and the links between the collection and, uh, and the drawings uh, and the, the vase in, in, in particular, you can, uh, you can see it. I think it's on the internet. Okay, thank you very much. And still, Navojka is 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 waiting yeah, the answer. To, 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 to Mrs. Navojka Cieślińska. Well, a uh, question was about uh, Gottlieb and other Polish Jewish artists. Uh, so uh, we know um, that Ruja was in touch with Leopold Gottlieb and Moisés Kisling, Moise Kisling in Paris. Uh, of course, they were uh, educated at the Academy of Fine Arts uh, just at the beginning of 20th century. Um, but there were, as far as we know, uh, in her collections, uh, in her collection um, uh, paintings by them. Uh, just some postcards preserved in family archive, uh, very brief, uh, greetings from Switzerland from Kisling, greetings from uh, Gottlieb uh, in Paris uh, with a postcard with his uh, portrait photo, um, and that's all. So that's that's only trace, not, uh, um, uh, not, we cannot be perfectly sure about, about uh, you know, this relation. Uh, and uh, the apartment, uh, the apartment by the Grodzka street in the heart of Old Town uh, in Krakow. Uh, well, actually, uh, during the, uh, the Second World War, uh, um, uh, it was occupied by a um, uh, high German officer uh, of, of, uh, of German Nazi army. Uh, stationed in Krakow. Um, we know from the relation, from the memoir of um, um, son of Ruja's uh, brother, that Ruja, after, um, after war, uh, coming to Krakow, entering the, the apartment, uh, um, uh, found uh, her pieces, um, uh, her, um, her objects, not only paintings, but, but uh, I mean the, um, the whole uh, objects collected in apartment, uh, quite uh, unchanged. So the paintings were still there. Um, yeah, yeah, that would be my answer.